Hello everyone, I am here with Donna Imem running in the 31st Congressional District of Texas. She is challenging a build-the-wall Trumpian Republican in a race that is very interesting to watch. It's a flippable district, and she is here to tell us why she's going to win. Donna, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. I really appreciate it. Now, I like this race because you were kind of explaining to me before we went on that nobody's paying attention to this race. And that really is a shame because you are so close to flipping this district. You're 2.9% away from winning that seat. It's very competitive, but yet the National Democratic Party and State Democratic Party, they don't really seem to be interested because they feel as if this isn't something that is worth really investing in because it's not winnable. Tell us why you decided to run and why this is, in fact, a flippable district. Yeah, so I'm an average middle class person that works for a living, right? I'm a computer engineer. I've been working in the tech industry. But over the last five years, I started working on a nonprofit. And the reason I started working on nonprofit is around 2004, 2006, I worked in Lafayette, Indiana, in an industry where on the bottom floor we had manufacturing. And every single one of those manufacturing workers were laid off. They had no reemployment opportunities, no way to get out, and some of them never worked a day in their life again. That's that left an impact on me. And that's why I chose a specific nonprofit because it focuses on education. It provides free continuing education to anybody who wants it. But why am I telling you this? The reason is, as I went through this nonprofit, what I realized is no matter how much time I poured into it, there were people in Austin, Texas that have been unemployed for years during the 2008, 2009 downturn, even though they were highly educated. And today, 2000, end of 2019, when supposedly the economy is amazing, right? People say the unemployment rate in Austin is low, but guess what? The unemployment rate in Austin is extremely high. And it's high because people are working whatever job they can find. They're working two, three jobs, even people with really great education. So I felt defeated working in a nonprofit. And I don't think any person should have to depend on philanthropy or a nonprofit to get by. Our system is completely broken, and I wanted to find a way to be part of that solution. I think if average people like me, people who have never aspired to run for office, people who are not necessarily activists, right? They're just general people who work for a living, trying to raise their families, trying to give them a good education. If we don't come together, we're not going to change the system. That's why I'm running. This race, you asked me why this is so exciting. Texas has six districts that the DCCC is targeted because they're very, very close. This is one of them. The reason it's close is this. Austin, over the last five years, has grown gangbusters, right? It went from a small, sleepy little town to a major city in the United States. And it's pushed people out into the suburbs two, three hours out of the city center because they just can't afford to live in the city anymore, right? It used to be a very affordable city. And as they push people out, you have young families moving into the suburbs. So I live in the North Austin area, and this area includes Williamson and Bell counties, and it goes all the way to Killeen, which has the largest military base in the United States, largest armored vehicle military base. This district has more veterans per square mile than anywhere else in, the, in, in all of Texas. This district is so close because just in the last year, after the 2018 cycle, we had 50,000 more people move into just one county because they're looking for a decent life. And that, that I know, like I said, it's 2.9 percent, that's 8,000 votes. So this race kit is flippable, it's winnable. But the crazy thing is this, I'm running on single payer healthcare for all. I'm running on education for all that incentivizes people to go serve in rural and underserved communities. And I'm running on what I call real pay for all, which says, look, you can't live on $15 an hour in most American cities. Definitely not Austin, Texas. I can guarantee you that. And that people should be paid a real wage, which means you can not only just pay your bills, but you should have the ability to purchase a home, put a down payment on a home, and you should be able to retire someday if you're working full time, okay? And the thing is, people are like, oh, well, you think that's going to work in Texas? You talk to every single person in Texas's 31st district, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Independent, Republican, and you say, 
we're trying to reduce the cost of healthcare because that's the real issue. And single payer does that. We're trying to reduce the cost of education so kids in Temple ISD and Colleen ISD can actually afford to live on UT Austin campus. That message resonates. We can flip this district blue on this platform. That's the crazy thing about it. And that's so interesting. So I was under the impression that the National Party wasn't necessarily paying attention to this race. But I think the real story here is that they're they're kind of overlooking you because there's this idea in these flippable districts that you cannot be a far left candidate. You know, there's this fear mongering about that. And the idea I'm assuming from the National Party and even the state party is that you have to run a campaign that's very moderate center of the road, because if you want to flip that district, then you need to pull in some Republican Party voters. Can you dive a little bit more into the detail as to why that's a horrible strategy and why getting out the vote is actually what will be conducive to a victory? Because I think that even though I talk about this, people in that district really need to understand why running you know a campaign that is progressive and bold it's not a lost cause in fact this is your best bet but i want to kind of hear it from you as to why you think being true to yourself and actually running on a campaign that you say 15 dollars is not enough you know that would scare a lot of people just instinctively and in thinking okay she's she's too far left she's no way she's gonna win so why do you think it's important to kind of push back against that narrative it's important to push back between that for that narrative because it's wrong. So as a techie and as a product manager, I ran some large product lines, right? There are tens of millions of people who use my notebooks. There are, you know, semiconductor product lines that are in everything from your toaster to a high speed train that I've worked on. So I understand the financial aspect of this. The fact is this, real pay for all is not out of reach and it will organically grow the economy. And I can make that I can make a strong ironclad financial case for that. I have white papers on every single policy proposal that I'm proposing. And here's the thing. When you tell people, look, you're going to have health care guaranteed no matter what. You're going to have hundreds of thousands of people going into entrepreneurship. That's going to generate real jobs because they have that peace of the mind that, hey, I'm not going to die if I go and try to start a business out of my garage, out of my living room. OK, when you pay people, especially something, people who make less than fifty thousand dollars a year or families that make less than seventy five thousand dollars a year, when you pay them an extra dollar, you know what they use it for? They use it to buy their kids a better pair of Nikes, a, a, a newer backpack. They go out with their family on Friday night and get a pizza together. That money goes right back into the economy. It creates more jobs and it creates high paid jobs. This is a message that resonates. It doesn't matter across it, across party lines, across thought processes. It's the way we talk about it. When we start using various labels, people can push you left and right. But the answer is this. Every single one of us has the same challenges. We're trying to pay our rent or pay our mortgage. We are trying to send our kids to school. Why? Because we want them to have a decent future ahead of them. And we want to be able to pay our bills. We don't want to bag on the streets. We don't want to be homeless. Most of us want to be able to go to the grocery store and live a dignified life. And we want to contribute to our community. And if we have the financial resource to do that, every single person is going to do that. And there's, an, there's a solid economic case for that. It's undeniable. And that's the message that we need to get to people. We keep you know, living on fear. We're never going to get to this. The biggest issue with districts like this, because it's been read from its inception, so the current representative has been in office for almost two decades, many people who believe in this don't really understand how close this district is. Because when you run in a U.S. congressional can you know, campaign or as a candidate, there's thousands of candidates across the country, right? So you get the least amount of exposure and not everybody's doing the research to find out, hey, there are all these districts in Texas. There's one in, you know, north of Austin that's ripe to go blue. We've got some great candidate there who's got these great ideas and people love it. I spent full time the first six months of 2019 just going across my district from city to city, talking to groups, bipartisan groups, nonpartisan groups, talking to place talking to people in places like for example lions clubs and just you know clubs that come together like business clubs that come together 
And every single person believes the same thing. They want opportunities. They don't want to pay huge taxes, but they're willing to pay for what makes sense. And, you know, when it comes to healthcare and education, look, Mike, you know this, we are overpaying for healthcare by trillions of dollars right now, right? We're overpaying for education. The cost of education is completely inflated. With technology, the cost of education should be one-tenth of what it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It's the opposite, right? And we know that these are inflated just because they can be. There's no actual logic behind it. So what I'm saying is, look, let's use technology. I'm an engineer. Let's use it. Let's use it to drive down the cost of education. In four years, we want it to be hacked. In another eight years, we want it to go down further. Let's put the right incentives in place so we can get state universities to, you know, sign on to these initiatives, right? Let's incentivize them to give them money. And let's do the same thing with healthcare. Let's go to single payer. Let's take out the billions of dollars that private healthcare insurance companies are making. Let's put more physicians because we have a huge lack of primary care physicians in this country, by the way, that nobody, have you heard anybody talk about this on the mainstream media, that we actually don't have enough doctors, if we, even if we want to cover the 80 million uninsured, underinsured. Let's scale the healthcare infrastructure. Let's put primary care clinics on in every neighborhood so people can get preventative care. So you don't get to third stage cancer, which is extremely expensive to treat right? These ideas, they resonate with every single person in my district. And that's why I'm running. That's why I believe I can flip it. And I would love any help because yes, financially, we're struggling. Yeah, you're running up against an incumbent who, as you said, has been there for almost two decades. John Carter was elected in 2003. And gradually over the years, he is losing support. But as I kind of alluded to in the beginning of this, this is a Trumpian Republican who is basically towing the Republican Party line. And I'm curious because you talk about all these issues and it makes sense. Like these are the kitchen table issues, so to speak, that a lot of people talk about that affect individuals. But I'm wondering how much since you're in the state of Texas, is he able to exploit issues and exploit xenophobia and whatnot and the issue of immigration um, because he wants to build the wall? That's kind of his his go to um, thing. He's, he's benefited from Trumpian uh, Trumpism. So um, how much is that an issue that's coming up? And how are people responding when you try to basically center them on what's the real issue? It's not, you know, immigrants who are hurting you economically. It's the system itself. It's elites. It's the rigged economy. How how does that play in terms of based uh, on people who you've spoken with? Yeah. So he's not just a build a wall guy. The current representative is a direct recipient of money from the GEO group, which runs the private prisons. And it mm. runs these cages that were keeping these kids you know, Carlos Hernandez, right? 16 year old kid who died co on a cold concrete floor. This is happening under our watch. No American, nobody in Texas 31, no patriotic person on this earth is gonna say, that's okay. There's nobody in my district that's gonna say, that's acceptable for you to take money from the GEO group, the group that runs these prisons where this boy died in his own pool of blood. There's nobody who believes that the wall is gonna help them be able to afford education for their kids, to send them to UT Austin. Nobody believes that. You couldn't even make them believe that. And it's completely distracting. But what we have, unfortunately, what these leaders have is they have certain mainstream media that are echoing this over and over and over again and that's all these people here, and we have to cut through this. The only way we cut through this, through this, is we run candidates who are talking about issue, you know, challenges that can be solved, and we talk about the solutions. The only way that we can combat this is that we have hundreds and thousands of U.S. congressional people that talk about solutions. We gotta stop talking about these generic keyword issues that are out there that we're supposed to use. Let's talk about healthcare. How do we get it? How do we reduce costs? Let's talk about education. How do we reduce it? How we how do we get it to every single kid? Doesn't matter if they want to go to trade school or college or two year. Doesn't matter, right? We have to talk about that, and we have to talk about it until we drown out the fake news that's going around and saying that immigrants are the challenges. Look, I'm an immigrant. I came to this country. The reason that I've been this successful and built a decent middle class life for myself 
is because I got a great education, a debt-free education. I got to do my graduate studies completely free on scholarships and assistantships. I didn't have to worry about $250,000 of debt. I was able to put a down payment on a home because I had what? A high paying job. I want that for every single American. I know we can get that to every single American. And I have the financial case for what we Democrats believe is the morally right thing to do. And I love your answer. And I like to ask this of people who are running in red districts because it really gives you a sense of whether or not they have the right strategy. And I think that you do. Like, there's a lot of people who I think they're going to vote for Donald Trump or the Republican regardless, right? So what matters is that you don't deviate from your platform and try to appeal to these types of people. The goal is to get out new people and people who really feel like they haven't been represented, who don't really care about these types of issues and who just want someone who's going to look out for them. But they kind of feel like, you know, the Republican or the Democrat, even in certain districts, they haven't been representing them. So, you know, what's the point of voting? They stay home. A lot of people kind of checked out. And so I love your strategy and people like you because you're you're basically doing something that hasn't been done, you know, energizing a portion of the electorate that has not participated in politics. Like if we if we want to live in not just a democracy, functionally speaking, but one that's thriving, we need people to to participate. And they're not currently. Voter turnout is low. Thankfully, it's up increasingly. But I mean, generally speaking, comparatively speaking, it's low. And people like you are trying to change that, which is phenomenal. And I don't think that a centrist is going to flip that district. If that district is flipped, and I think it will be, it's going to be because of you. So I want you to talk through the dynamics of this primary, because this is currently a competitive primary. You're yes. running against other Democrats. And if I had to make a prediction before you tell me, um, you are not someone who the establishment is taking much interest in so talk through who you're running against and who i'm assuming that you know more establishment corporatist democrats have kind of coalesced around because there always seems to be in each district one candidate who is pulling in the most amount of money usually from special interests talk a little bit about the dynamics here and um where you kind of stand out yeah, so we have five people in the primary. So our filing date was uh, yesterday, by the way. And we have our primary early voting is February 18th. So we're literally, <laughs> you know, less than two months away from early voting. And our actual primary day is March 3rd, okay? So out of the five candidates, most of us really don't have any kind of background in politics, as in we're not traditional politicians. There is one person that's ran before, but the, here's, here's what makes me different, okay? All of these folks are coming in and they're running basically on bread and butter democratic sort of messaging, right? And I am, I am running on very specific policy. I am saying, look, I believe in single payer healthcare, but in order to accelerate Medicare for all, which I want to, right? I want to accelerate single payer Medicare. I want to scale the infrastructure. I want to make sure we incentivize more primary care physicians so when Medicare for all gets implemented, it'll actually be successful. The, what differentiates me is that I'm trying to bring ideas and solutions that will actually work. They're executable and we can pay for them. And there's a financial case behind them. Education, same thing. I'm saying, look, if we want to get school teachers and social workers and physicians to rural places, we got to incentivize them. We have to pay off their student loans completely and say, come, come out and teach in Salado, Texas, come out and teach in Temple, Texas, come out and teach in Killeen, Texas, right? The biggest challenge with most you know, folks that are running in the primary right now is that they don't realize that, for example, my district in Bell County, there's a 25 to 30% black American population, right? No one realizes that you need to go and ask for their vote and you need to give them something to vote for. They're not just gonna come out and vote for you because you're a Democrat, right? I've spent, you know, the entire year talking to all the leadership and all the communities in, in the black community, for example. And you know what they told me? This is fact. They said, Donna, we know you love to talk about health care, but black people, we've never had health care. We can't even get a job. To us, the justice system is a huge problem. And I listened to them. I formulated my own equal justice for all policy proposal. I have a white paper, it's published on my website. 
I send it out to all the black leaders that I could and I know in the community. I asked them to review it, give them their feedback, and they did. They gave me edits. They told me the problems that they faced, especially if you've been incarcerated for whatever reason, it is so impossible to get a decent paying job, even if you want to turn your life around, right? We developed equal justice for all policy. We made it a core platform portion. So we're addressing the needs of the people in Texas, the 31st district directly. You see what I'm trying to say, which is most Democrats, they're not, they're running on a generic message and you can't win. You have to engage people. You have to give them a reason to come out and vote. And you have to give them a reason to believe that somehow you're going to bring change because just running for office doesn't matter if you can't bring real change and impact to people's lives. We have people here who have less than $400 in their bank account and they literally cannot pay for their grocery bill. Imagine if you're a kid and you come home from school and you're expected to do your homework and there's not a single snack for you. How do you focus? How can you ever want, you know, expect that that kid is going to have a, a life that's accomplished compared to somebody who comes home and their mom is at home or their nanny's at home and they have a meal in the refrigerator and they can focus and they do have a high speed Internet connection so they can do their homework. You can't expect the same out of those two kids. That's reality. We have to talk to reality and stop talking in generic terms. And that's how we're going to flip this district. And I think that that is so important that you said that because a lot of politicians, they're running because they love the sound of their own voices, right? They talk at people and not get their feedback and talk to people. And I think that that's really such a crucial part of what makes a good campaign because in each district, there's going to be a very specific set of issues that impact voters differently. People of color will have different um, experiences in certain parts of the country and certainly different experiences than their white counterparts. There's all these different concerns that people have, but they haven't had anyone just ask them, what do you need? You know, what issues affect you? What type of policy do you think would help your life? And I think that that's so different. And we're, we're starting to see a paradigm shift in this country where people aren't just running on that generic platform. I mean, they are right. Uh, you, you, you're experiencing that with your uh, with your opponents, but more people are rising up and they're they're trying to actually do something that hasn't been done. And that is represent the people. You know, the House of Representatives is the people's house. You're supposed to represent right. the people. But we've kind of we've gotten fixated on this generic idea that we have to appeal to moderates and be center of the road in these purple districts or red districts. And it's not working. People aren't voting for Democrats because Democrats aren't listening to them. And you're changing that. Right. So anyone who's watching this, I think, is going to be convinced that you're the real deal. And if they want to flip that <laughs> district, they've got to vote for Donna. So give us your pitch and let us know what we can do to help you. If you're inside that district, especially, what can we do to volunteer? Okay, so there's there's a couple of things you can do. One, if you're out, if you're inside the district, we need you. you we can put you to work in many different areas. We need to, we need you to go talk to your neighbors. We, we need you to go talk to your organizations. We need you to knock on any door. We need you to make calls on behalf of us. That's how we reach people. We have to have that conversation, that point of contact. There's only one of me, okay? And there's only so much I can do. And until we get everybody involved in this movement, we can't flip this district. You don't win a district because you have a great candidate. You don't win a district because you have a great message. You win a district because the people in that district demand change. They demand new representation. And so we need you if you're in that district. Now, we also need money because at the end of the day, you still have to print content and literature and go door to door and you need some people to help you with van and you need some field organizers to cut you lists. So we need every dollar we can get. Look, we're a completely grassroots campaign, no corporate PAC money. We barely have any large donations. It's all small donations. So any dollar amount you can throw our way before December 31st would make a huge impact. And I'll tell you what, for a campaign like ours, November and December are really complicated and hard times to raise money. But more importantly, a candidate like me who's running for, for the first time, I spend most of my time campaigning, going to events, trying to meet people. So I don't have the eight or nine hours a day to be calling people and asking for money, which is what a lot of the ca corporate candidates are doing. They, every single corporate candidate tells me they spend a minimum of eight hours on what's called call time. That's calling wealthy donors and asking them to make $2,800 contributions. 
I literally do not have time for that. I'm, I've been trying to go out and meet with the community and shake their hands and tell them who I am because they've never met me. They don't know who I am. So you can see how important it is to have that contact because people trust you based on looking into your eye and talking to you and seeing what you're going to do for them. That's how they develop trust, right? So yes, there's lots of ways you can help. And even if you're outside the district, you can help make phone calls and, and call inside the district and, and, and tell people about us. We can do this. This is a winnable district. Help me get through the primary and I promise I'll deliver you Texas 31 and I'll turn Texas blue. That sounds absolutely phenomenal. And imagine if we brought in the squad in Congress, so to speak, and got someone from Texas elected. That would be absolutely just amazing. And I think the establishment would be shocked. And to kick out a Republican who's been there for almost 20 years, who's a Trumpian Republican, I mean, imagine how amazing that would feel if you contributed to that process. So uh, one more time, tell us the date of the primary before we go. So the date of the primary is March 3rd. Early voting is February 18th. Uh, and if you want to check out my website or my policy, it's at votefordonna.com. All right. We'll also have that information up on the screen. Donna, thank you so much for coming on. We will be rooting for you and watching this race very closely. Thank you so much, Mike. I really, really appreciate it.